Andy Collins from the Mind Gym. Now, when we started our world of lockdown so many months ago, Andy was the first person to contact me. And I don't know whether or not uh, it was a willing opportunity, but I embraced that conversation and Andy stepped forth and gave us one of the best webinars that we did throughout this series. And so much so we've had lots of uh, requests for a return visit. So I thought what a better way to kick off day two than invite Andy back and uh, share with us your thoughts, views, and really what you think the future holds for us all across HR public sector. Andy, it's great to have you back and the floor is yours. It's good to be back. And uh, that's a fantastic welcome. Thank you very much. And um, I think this is the first time, and maybe this is a bit cheeky of me to say so, but to join a PPA Met event on the second day where people haven't got hangovers and we haven't just enjoyed the partying and the dancing. And I'll make no comments about previous dancing abilities. Um, but I've certainly missed it. But it's wonderful to see you in the morning, bright eyed and bushy tailed. And... Um, and ready to listen so that's lovely <laughs> and uh, I'm just gonna share with you some slides and, and the idea of really this this next half an hour is to share with you some some thoughts and some insights where we've seen um, things progressing in these very unusual times and how we've seen um, people being supported etc and thank you for those who said they missed my dancing um, so let me uh, share my screen with you This is when we've all had those panic moments in these virtual meetings where does it work? Is it, is it all set up properly? So hopefully this is all, all good for you. So I think that it's fair to say that we've had some turmoil over the last six, seven months. I think I forget how long I've been at home now. Um, and, and what I hope to share with you over the next half an hour are some tools that I think will be useful. I think if you look at lots of organizations, we've been thrown at so much information recently so if I can just give you one or two things that I hope will help, then I, hopefully I would have done my job this morning. Um, for those of you who don't know Mind Gym, um, we are a training organization. And one of the things that we, I, I guess, makes us unique or that we try and support more than the learning itself is the interventions afterwards. So supporting the change of behaviors. So it's one thing to attend a great training session and often people remember the trainer rather than what they've learned. Um, what we try and do is change and improve behaviors. Um, and I'm privileged to have worked with a number of you in the past and currently, um, and we work with lots of organizations across the globe. So I won't dwell too much on that. What I have seen over the last um, period as I've been working with clients, especially those um, uh, in both central government and local government is that you're delivering in turbulent times. And I think, and that is to be respected. I think you've had to adjust things and shift things quickly. Um, I think you've had to remain resilient and engaged. And I think people forget that whilst we talk about the challenges of virtual working, one of the challenges that of course all local authorities have had is that you still had to support residents. So you've had a whole team of employees that are not working virtually, they carry on as, as normal. Um, and that creates its own challenges. You've had increased challenges in terms of people dealing with uh, increased phone calls and calls into customer service teams and customer centers. Um, I've worked with a number of local authorities that have seen sadly an increase in things like domestic abuse. And so some of those care services have had to increase their support. Uh, and from a, a remote leadership point of view, that's been a challenge. I think Again, a lot of organizations have been talking for years about can we work more agile, can we work more remotely? And this has forced us to do so. It doesn't necessarily mean that we've all been prepared. And then you've got change of organization structure. Um, I, I, if I asked a show of hands and I won't see them all, how many people have recently recruited somebody that they've never actually met in person? And they've done a virtual interview and then that person still hasn't met the rest of the team and that can stem right from the top leadership team right down to, to junior level. So we're going through these unprecedented times and I think it's taught us a great deal. So where are we now? I think at the beginning stages, we had this phase that we called un acute uncertainty. And I think that lasted about two to six months where we didn't quite know what we were doing, bit of a rabbit in the headlights. Um, 
And we've all been looking forward to this wonderful thing called new normal, which no one quite knows what it means yet. And we don't know how far off we are, um, but it's something that we're looking forward to. And we're trying to prepare ourselves for that. But where we are now and where I believe we are now is this just extended period of prolonged disruption. So a return to normality, whatever normality is now. Um, and trying to just reorganize and reorganize and readjust and, and restructure ourselves to deliver in these new ways. And I would imagine that many of you have had to restructure how your teams work and how your organizations work several times. I was talking with a client yesterday who suddenly had to procure 1400 laptops because their teams had to work from home and everyone had a, a PC in the office. Um, and so, you know, that creates its own challenges from an infrastructure point of view. And so what are some of the things that we've seen as part of, and some of you will, will smile as you see some of these, maybe we've had some burnout. Um, we've had some uh, challenges for people. And I think we've seen this from our own selves and our teams in that we've, we've seen some of this burnout. And then there's the opt out. And that is this ongoing challenge where actually right now, family has always been important, but family is more important than my work. And we've had to adjust to manage children and working habits um, and different environments. For me, I was so excited that for the first time in, I think 15 years, I don't have to commute. And I thought about the three to four hours that I was gonna save every day. And uh, three of my sons ended up getting a job because they were um, laid off in a warehouse. And they start at six o'clock in the morning and finish at two in the afternoon. And none of them have passed their driving test because they were all canceled due to lockdown. So my excitement about not having to get up in the morning was soon quashed as I have to get up at 5.15 in the morning to take them to work. So uh, priorities change and we, we look at things slightly differently. Uh, and then there's this coping. So I'm getting on with my work, I'm doing what I'm asked to do, but actually I'm keeping out of sight and I'll wait and see what happens. Um, and I'm not necessarily pushing myself to, to be at the forefront of things. Um, and then, then we have this sort of committed phase where I'm finding answers to, to way of dealing with new things. I'm looking for ways to contribute and being part of the solution and part of the team. And I'm trying to find this, the source of energy, not only to support myself, but to support my colleagues. Um, and so where have we focused and, and we've seen much effort in these areas in terms of putting a lot of effort into how do we work virtually? And that's the practicalities and, and, and the environmental challenges. And I see so many times now that if you look on the back of people's screens, people who've been reluctant to share some of their personal life, now all of a sudden we're in each other's homes. We're in kitchens, we're in offices, we're working from bedrooms. Um, I was talking to a client the other day that was in their camper van. And uh, so, you know, we're all working in these unusual environments. And amongst all of that, we've had to help protect our well-being. So what are we doing to protect against anxiety and isolation? Some people have loved the fact that they are away from an office, away from commuting, away from public transport, um, and away from people. And other people are feeling very anxious and very isolated. Um, and so how are we as leaders and managers and individuals supporting one another and understanding those challenges. And then there's the, uh, the opportunity to lead as a manager and as a leader and to understand, well, how do we gain the best performance from our teams? What is it that they need and how can we support them? So I'm going to share with you just some, some thoughts and ideas as, as to what we've done and what we think could be done. And some of these you'll be doing already um, and some of these, uh, will be new to you and you'll think, great, we'll give that a, a try. I think certainly when you look at navigating virtual meetings, we've all had the joys of uh, joining late, tech not working, avoiding the camera because of all sorts of reasons. Um, but, but I think it's now everyday life and I almost, um, I almost panic now when our family wants to have a virtual games night because I've been on Zoom all day and thought of having another one. Um, but we find ways to make it work. But I think one of the key things on this particular slide is that we set goals and boundaries and that we let people know what is acceptable, what isn't, how we work together, understand people's personal environments, 
and that we we support one another rather than judging one another. When it comes to well-being, um, certainly I've seen a number of my team I know that have had the isolation blues. Um, I have quite a, a young team and they love being in London and many of them have been in flat shares and they haven't been able to work from home so they've gone and lived with their parents for the last six months um, and many of them have said there's a reason why they stopped living with their parents and now they've had to go back and they've faced all the challenges of that and, uh, and, and then you've got teams and individuals who are actually working from home they don't have family around them or they don't have support around them and that's been an issue as well and actually being at work is where their social interactions came into play and then others who are quite happy just to, to be around their family. Um, and that's actually where they found the most strength and the most support. But I think the key thing that we've seen across, as I've worked with so many organizations, is that it's not the same for everyone. And just because you think one way doesn't mean others think that way. And, and I really liked the comment that was made just before I came on about this principle of hope and um, in creating that environment where we feel hopeful. It is a strange world. Um, but we need to feel hopeful that there's um, a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think there's this principle of being kind to yourself. Um, I went through the early stages of lockdown of um, working long hours, um, basically not leaving my office, not going for a walk, and just feeling particularly unhealthy. And then I realized actually going for a walk at lunchtime, going, for a, you know, going in a routine and doing all those things is important. And I think equally for local authorities, you have the unique challenge that you have both virtual workers, but you also have those frontline staff um, who are dealing with situations where maybe they don't want to go out to work and they don't want to be in the general public because of the, the fears and the, and the challenges that that faces. And how do we best support their well-being and their and understanding that their world is different? And then I think this this principle of leading remotely and especially in this uh, crisis situation and one of the things that I've seen is this um, this principle of watching our bias or watching your bias um, we have seen more of people in their own home environments than we have ever done in a very long time um, and I, it's very easy to pass judgment on people's personal circumstances um, but I think as we've started to work in this environment more I've had some wonderful conversations with uh, both colleagues and clients where one of the children has run into the room singing something from frozen and uh and initially they've been embarrassed and then you know they've just embraced it and said this is how my life is right now you're gonna have to accept that the dog might bark in the background or one of my children might run in and we start to just break down some of those barriers and we start to think about each other in a slightly different light and realize that people have different circumstances and i've seen senior executives who have always tried to have this sort of um, very focused, very approached look, having to deal with exactly the same ch challenges of children running into the room, knocking over lights and doing all sorts of things while they're on a, uh, an important Zoom meeting. So we, we need to be aware of that and we need to be aware that as leaders, don't get into those biases. We've had enough challenges um, with diversity and inclusion over the years. Um, let's not create more by the current environment and the current situations that we're in. So I'm gonna give you sort of five things that I think are key to performing in this world. Uh, one is creating a sense of agency. So this is how do I help my team complete tasks? Have I given them enough opportunity and choice about how they complete a task? It's not the case that we're in the office and we're doing things the same way. So how can I coach my team to have that growth mindset that they look for opportunities in the way that they do things and also with that agency doesn't come the feeling that well i've been given this sort of free reign as to how i do the job or how i do this particular project but i don't want to be judged as to how i i, I got to the end result i want to be judged on the on the positive things um, and so we need to create that environment that people have agency but not then suddenly chosen because they did it in a different way to the way that you would do it. And I've seen more and more that people have, uh, the more that they've been given agency, the more that they've flourished and the more that they've found opportunities to develop themselves and to grow and to seek feedback about how they're doing. 
And then I love this principle of hope. Um, I can see my future to a better way of doing things. So how do I enable team members to reprioritize tasks? How do I equip managers to support from some of the practical needs that they have, but also some of the emotional support that we need to give one another. And we provide hope that there is a way out of this and that we can work together and that um, there is huge from this. I've seen some wonderful examples of um, people where they've been working in an environment where they feel there is hope and that there is support. And I've seen people on the opposite side where they feel it's all doom and gloom. And I promise you productivity soon reduces as they feel this doom and gloom. But if they start to feel this level of hope that there is a, an opportunity to do things differently. I think all of us have felt the sense of belonging. Um, I might be working remotely, I work, might be working in the community, but where is my sense of belonging? Is there an opportunity for our team to have these virtual cuppers as, a, as my boss calls them? And to create these bonds and bridges I think what happens in the office is that you have these um, social interactions and you see people that you um, regularly come in contact with, both friends and colleagues. Being isolated potentially at home, um, you don't have that same interaction. So how can we create that? How can we create that sense of belonging both as team and as the organization so that people all feel part of this together? And I think that, that when you start to get some of these things right, as many of you will have done, you start to see people just progressing a lot further. Purpose, does my work really matter? The world is in chaos, does what I'm doing really make a difference? Is it worth doing it? Is it important that I'm doing it? Um, and I think the more that we can help people understand that there is purpose to what they do and reinforce some of those missions and some of those values that you have as an organization and celebrate success when it happens. Um, even if that's just in a small team, it's really important that people feel that their work is valued and that they're doing something that makes a difference. And especially um, you're giving so much support through your, through your teams, to residents and community. Um, people need to feel that that's valued um, and, and are grateful for the work that they've done. And something we sometimes forget and you won't see it on any competency framework often, but that's joy. Is my work fun? Am I enjoying what I'm doing? Is there some energy in the room? Is there some, you know, do I feel positive and supported? And occasionally just being humble and a little bit humorous. If any of you have seen many of Lethem's videos, I have never seen such outfits and we've all enjoyed those. Um, and it's just a way of creating that, uh, I guess that environment of humble humility and, and humorous, just a bit of fun in what we do. And so I think there's an opportunity to embrace this principle of joy and finding new ways to find that. And, and it, it can be a very sort of doom and gloom environment at the moment, but how do we support each other in finding joy in what we do, finding joy in, in even just the small successes. And even if that means, uh, you know, having more virtual meetings where there, it's not just a meeting, but it's just an opportunity to, to chat or meet or, talk about something other than work, but creating those environments that would normally exist and making sure that frontline staff are involved in that too and not forgotten um, because they're still out and they're still working in, in front of people. So I think if you look at those five, agency, hope, belonging, purpose, and joy, if you look at some of the impacts that that creates, if we create more agency, people feel more committed and have a lot less intention to leave. If we increase hope and people see that there's a better future, then we start to think about others more. We start to think about the world that we work in. How can we support other people in our teams and our, you know, our colleagues, our, our family, those around us? How can we instill that hope in others when we feel it ourselves? That sense of belonging creates that personal satisfaction and promise you reduces stress. Um, it starts to make us feel that we're valued and that we're important. And purpose, we start to feel more engaged. We start to feel that we have purpose in our work and that, it's, and that what we do is respected and valued and is important. And again, we have less intention to leave. If I feel that what I'm doing is not worth it, then I will look elsewhere. And I think that's common for many people. And, and lastly, let's have some fun and let's have some joy. 
And the direct impact of that is in any organization when you're working with colleagues, teams, customers, residents, whoever it might be, that their satisfaction increases because you just have a, a more joyous um, approach to things. And it may sound a bit um, crass or cheesy to say that, but I think having hope and having joy are two of the most important things on these five lists. Agency without hope is just, uh, it misses some of the points. Having purpose without joy, again, it just becomes a job and doesn't feel the same. Um, and if I have belonging, then I start to feel that hope and I start to feel that joy and they start to link together. Um, I'm conscious of always trying to uh, stay on time. So those five things I think are pivotable in any organization to, to maybe think about, am I as a manager, a leader, as an individual, am I doing these things? Am I finding these opportunities to, to create these environments where people feel that they do have agency? Um, or they do feel belonging or they feel purpose. And as we start to look at some of the areas where I know that organizations are looking at development and, and starting to get back in terms of supporting staff in terms of their personal development and organizational development, all the time these three are the ones that come up. So looking at diversity and inclusion, performance management and management development. So when we look at diversity and inclusion, you know, belonging is one of those key things that needs to fit into that. And are we making sure that our network groups are working together in this virtual environment? Are they supporting everyone, both frontline and, and remote staff? Are we making sure that we don't create more exclusion because of things, uh, because of things we see on you know, cameras and the way that people work from home? And performance management is challenging time at the best of things, um, but doing that virtually, and doing that con consciously and regularly and make it a performance uh, management process that both creates purpose for individuals and creates agency rather than a tick box exercise of going through an old appraisal system. Um, it's vital that we, we make sure people feel supported in this world. Um, and management, I think we have a huge opportunity to, from a leadership perspective, create that hope and that joy from a, um, from a senior perspective so that it flows across the organization and that we don't feel panicked about things. If I think about this conference as a really good example um, and as a, I guess an analogy to people going back to the office or the current working environment, there are many of you that have enjoyed conference physically in the past, love networking, love meeting colleagues, love having a drink in the bar, uh, love making a fool of ourselves on the dance floor um, and clapping loudly at the awards ceremonies. But also there are many people that have never been able to attend conference because budgets didn't allow travel or didn't allow hotel costs or those kind of things. And they're going to be able to experience a conference that they normally wouldn't be able to attend. Maybe there are some that don't really like seeing each other dancing. I don't really enjoy the networking and the social aspect and just want to sit quietly in the background. And there's an opportunity for them to really feed into this and to find that. And I think it just goes to show that we are all different and that we look at things in different ways. And in your organizations, it will be exactly the same. Um, just because we think one way doesn't mean that others think in exactly the same way. So if you do one thing, if you look at this middle section around prolonged disruption, Leaders give hope, managers coach for agency, and I think we all have a responsibility to build community and to build belonging in our teams and support one another. And if you're going to do anything in terms of support, in terms of learning and development, again, my experience tells me, especially in the current climate, we're being thrown with all sorts of things. So keep it simple, little and often works, you know, the days of uh, one and two day training um, interventions are just not happening now. Be flexible about what you do. Some people might want to do it as a, an individual learning through digital. Other people might want to be in a virtual setting, others in a much larger setting. Um, and focus on changing behaviors um, versus just throwing content at people. And I think a lot of the time when I think about diversity and inclusion, that's a good example. 
diversity and inclusion is not a tick box exercise. It's about changing behaviors about how we work together and support one another and accept one another. And so, and I'll gloss over this very quickly. If any of you want to learn a bit more about what we do, I will happily, uh, normally I would come and visit you and bring a packet of biscuits, um, but I'm happy to do a, a virtual consultation and meet with you. And thank you very much for your time. I think I have, I think I've hit my half an hour spot. If there are any questions or anything you want to throw at me in the chat, please do. But I hope that gives you some insight and some, uh, and some help. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Andy, for that. Um, there's really great and interesting content there. And one thing that's emerged in the chat is your uh, phrase around um, new normal. <laughs> that you've been referring to, and that um, the sun doesn't kind of uh, sit comfortably on the. Can you give us a bit of um, context in terms of uh, why you chose that particular um, expression? Yeah, I think there's been lots of discussions, and I think when lockdown kicked off, everyone thought this would last for a couple of months, and then we go back to a new normal world, which is half of the team working remotely, or we'll all go back to the office. And we had lots of preconceived ideas as to what this new normal might look like. I.e., does it mean that everyone's now working remotely? Does it mean we're all working in the office? Do we even know what the new world looks like? And so what I've noticed is that lots of clients several months ago had a prescribed list of how they thought things would work going forward. And now they've almost thrown that out, the, out of the window because we don't know what the new normal looks like. Um, so I think in the slide that I shared it, it basically shares the principle that we don't know what new normal is. We need to be prepared to understand what is it when we get there. Um, does it mean that, so for our organization, for example, almost all of our staff work in the office. We have very few who work remotely. We're now looking at everyone working four days a month in the office. And then it might extend to eight days a month. Um, and how do we organize the, the infrastructure to make that work? So I don't know if that really answered the question, but I think it's more this point of saying, what, what will the world look like going forward? Because what we did six, eight months ago will not be the same going forward. We have to look at a new way of doing things. And what does that look like? And do, does everyone feel engaged with that and part of that? So some of the um, alternative expressions people have popped into chat are things like building back stronger, you know, and there was some, some reference to the fact that what we're experiencing, there's nothing about what we're experiencing currently, which is normal, you know, and fighting the pandemic, for example, is, there's nothing normal about that. Um, and so does this, you know, and is, there in, is there significance in the type of language that we're using to try and explain the future and where we're going to? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, I think we just we just need to accept that the world isn't as organised as we'd like it to be. Yes. And we can have wonderful structures and, and plans of what we think the world might look like, mm. but we need to be agile and ready for the fact that it, whatever we think is in our plan, it's just not going to happen the way mm. we planned it. Um, so we've got to be agile, but. I think the new normal for me and, and the way that we work with clients, the new normal is that you need to be agile. The new normal is that it's not as structured as it used to be. Yeah. You have to accept that people have got different ways of doing things. And we found that some people have been 10 times more productive by working from home and not being distracted in the office. And we've also found people who have been 10 times less productive because they're either isolated or dealing with family issues or whatever it might be. So we've, we've got to understand that I think the new normal is that it's, we, we need to be agile and prepared for anything that comes at us. An interesting question has been raised by uh, Tracy Brennan, who is just sharing some concerns that <clears throat> have been put forward to ensure new recruits, particularly apprentices and you know, those who are perhaps it's their first job in the workplace. How do we support them and um, ensure that they can learn and develop positively in terms of having this as a great experience? I and mean, you see this also with some university students going off for that university experience, but in our world, apprentices and trainees in particular, anything that you've seen around which can help us with that? Yes, I, a couple of things that I've seen are making sure that those new recruits 
are quickly are as quickly as possible embedded into the teams that they're going to be working with. So rather than just inviting them to the next meeting about a particular subject, why not have a, a virtual introduction, which is literally just a 20 minute team meeting just for the new person to introduce themselves, say hello to the team and meet them rather than coming into the first operational meeting. I think there's that social interaction that is, is vitally important to give them that sense of belonging. Um, then I think there's an opportunity for both in terms of learning and development and support to make sure that, that they're involved as much as possible in any opportunity to learn both about the organization, to learn about the values and the, and the principles of the organization and the ways of working, but also to give them support in their new role as much as possible. Because typically you'll find that a new employee will either be shy or very happy to come and walk over to your desk and say, I don't understand this, can you help me? Now they'll send an email or they'll find some other method and it's just not that same interaction. So creating opportunities for interaction, I think is key. Um, and I think that that's what I've seen really help is to make them feel a part of the organization as quick as possible by not just inviting them to the next meeting, but giving them an opportunity to introduce themselves and for the team to introduce themselves to them. Mm. Otherwise they just feel isolated. Thank you for that. Two last things to finish, Andy, before we say a huge virtual thank you. Um, in regard to your point in terms of, you know, bringing some joy or fun into this space of what can be pretty dark and very um, threatening for some, you know, I was surprised, uh, well, you know, was I surprised? You know, the, the videos you referred to in terms of me uh, foolishly humiliating myself in, in front of thousands of people did actually result in quite a number of people contacting me to say, how dare you um, be so stupid and ridicule in, in this kind of time of tragedy. And of course, part of this in terms of bringing some hope and opportunity and the fact that in adversity, you've got to be able to somehow find a release and that sense of being able to smile, you know, because otherwise, where do you get hope from? You know, does bring with it, you know, certainly as leaders and organizations, the need to be vulnerable and courageous in your ability to kind of step out of that space of comfort because it will be uncomfortable to do it. Um, but I was really quite taken by uh, the conversations that I then followed that up with the individual to say, well, just let me help understand where you're coming from to find out why you find this so um, uncomfortable to see somebody uh, attempting to bring a smile to people's face. Thankfully, thousands of people thought I was completely ridiculous. <laughs> and we were going to bring this to our conference, but maybe next year we bring some of um, the favorite dancers back for people to experience and experiment with. Sadly, that wasn't fancy dress. You know, this is my wardrobe. That's the other thing. <laughs> and the other question that everybody wants to know is, is this beard kind of growing through lockdown? Because it's kind of a, it's a different <laughs> look for us. So, is, so this the, the, is this the new normal for Andy? So the easy, the first question, the second question is the easy one. Yes, the beard is staying. <laughs> um, yeah, this has been my, I went through a period of having no haircut and not cutting my beard. And I, I, I did look a bit scruffy. So I've at least cut my hair. Um, so yeah. And I think when it comes to the joy part, and I think it's that principle of understanding what, what you do and what other people do might be very different. Yeah. I might not feel very comfortable wearing a silly top hat and the green suit, but you do. And I think it's about embracing those differences as individuals. Um, we have every Friday, we have um, a kind of end of the week company meeting. There's about 200 of us in the organization. And every, every Friday, the last half an hour of the Friday, we have a, a virtual get together where we, we meet. And it's been quite intense because we've been sharing information and, and, and doing lots of different things. And two weeks ago, the exec decided that rather than just throwing information at us, they'd do a skit. So four of them got together and they did like this funny, silly little play that they did together. And all of a sudden we saw our leadership team in a very different light. Um, and some will say, well, you're the senior leadership team. You really shouldn't be messing about wearing a silly outfit on a Friday afternoon. But we realized afterwards that, and one of them actually said that this was an opportunity for them to relax as well. 
as give an opportunity for the team to see them in a slightly different light and just to make it a bit of fun. So it's about finding that balance. Um, but I do think you've got to do something to just step out of the norm. We're having too many meetings now, which are just meetings. And we don't have these fun social interactions where we either go to lunch together or we chat around in the office or, you know, we do different things. So finding somewhere to have some joy, I think is really important. Mm. I don't know if that answered the question, but that's, I'm not going to wear a top hat. <laughs> well, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> We've got some fantastic um, questions for you, which we will pick up and pass on to Andy. And when we get the responses back, we will share those with you in the online forum. And uh, Andy, thank you so much uh, for joining us today and giving us your time so uh, freely and willingly. It was great to have you back and I look forward to seeing you again in the not too distant future. So a huge virtual round of applause. Thank you to